Um, my name is, is Kevin Connor. I am the director of the Public Accountability Initiative, which is a nonprofit uh, watchdog research organization focused on issues of corruption in the United States. And I'm the co founder of our website, uh, littlesys.org, which is obviously Big Brother. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And I'm going to speak today about turning the tables on Big Brother and specifically about how some of the tools and techniques of the surveillance apparatus of Big Brother, of Big Brother, uh, can be turned against uh, the power elite, the 1% to great effect. And that might sound kind of scary. It's really not if we really dig into it. But um, essentially, you've got, I, 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 you know, so many of the talks, uh, which I've really enjoyed so far, uh, have really resonated with me and sort of what I've been talking about. Power has come up a lot. And I guess uh, what I'm going to talk about is kind of turning the tables on. Uh, we've got this surveillance apparatus. Uh, what, what can we do uh, to challenge it? And part of that is, is about surveillance or watching from below, watching up at the powers that be. If surveillance is used to sort of repress and control, repress dissent, as we've heard so much about, um, surveillance or watching from below can be used to challenge the power of, of this power structure. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Little Sis, uh, sort of the ideas behind that, a little bit of my work at the Public Accountability Initiative, share some stories of the kinds of uh, corruption we've found, and, um, and also talk about how some of these methods and tools I'm talking about can be used in other contexts, not just the U US, but Kosovo or, or wherever you're interested in, in um, looking at, at this power structure. Um, and if I get to it, if I have time, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how this stuff applies to the fight against Big Brother, whatever that is. Um, so Big Brother, meet, meet Little Sis. And to introduce Little Sis, I'm actually going to talk about a program called Total Information Awareness. Has anyone heard of, of this, Total Information Awareness? So Total Information Awareness was this uh, program launched within the Department of Defense in 2002. Um, not only did they choose like a crazy, really horrible sounding name for it, very Orwellian, uh, but they also chose this logo, which I don't know if you can see it, but it, it, it's a pyramid with a Masonic eye kind of shining down on the world. It's like a conspiracy theorist dream like, I found it. It actually exists, you know? Um, and so this was their logo. And um, some of the key ideas of, of total information awareness are really interesting. One of the main ideas uh, was to build this centralized sort of grand database of information uh, with dossiers on every American citizen, um, detailing everything from credit card purchases to uh, what books you've taken out of the library to uh, where you've traveled and, and your web history. Um, the point of total information awareness was to analyze all this data uh, and find patterns of, of suspicious behavior and terrorism uh, within this much larger social graph. Um, this quote is really long, but basically I want to highlight that they were really focused on links between people and organizations and things finding patterns in this network uh, of connections. Um, this is a, an official who was in the Total Information Awareness uh, program, and he was describing it to uh, the Department of Defense. Um, they put together these amazing graphics, which you probably can't really see the words, but it's, um, I'm pretty sure this, I'm not totally sure that this was their graphic, but from what I can tell, it was. And so you've got this like innocuous looking jogger who might actually be a terrorist and then you've got all these lines to, and, and these, this is different uh, pieces of information. Uh, let me just read you some of them. We've got uh, financial, education, travel. Uh, my favorite is veterinary, uh, which is like care for pets and animals and stuff. Um, very strange. And so that goes into the central repository for careful analysis, and then we identify terrorists. Obvious stuff. Um, so of course, there was a lot of criticism of this program. Uh, the, the American Civil Liberties Union said that, that it was 
of it would kill privacy in the US. William Sapphire of the New York Times said it was Orwellian, a super snoop's dream. It spurred this backlash against the program, and it was shut down, except, of course, it, it wasn't really shut down. Many of the same methods and tools and, and uh, analytical tools that Total Information Awareness was investigating and making use of uh, have, of course, appeared in the recent um, NSA disclosures uh, that came out of the, the Snowden documents. So for instance, uh, the New York Times, can, can people read that at all? Yeah? OK. Um, you can't read that, but you get the idea. It's a graph of social connections. Uh, the New York Times published a story that said that the NSA uh, is gathering data on the social connections of US citizens. Uh, there's been a lot about how the NSA was using these graphs of, of different connections to uh, ostensibly identify terrorists within this larger network. Uh, so kind of the second idea I want to get to uh, before I talk about Little Sis is who are the powers that be? You know, we often rage against the powers that be, uh, you know, in our particular countries or regions, domains. Um, it's a really interesting question. Who, who are they actually and, and can we identify them in any meaningful way? Um, and one of the inspirations for my work at Little Sis uh, is this uh, field of power structure research in the United States. I was part of the discipline of sociology. One of the main figures in that field uh, was C. Wright Mills. Another was this gentleman, uh, William Domhoff, who wrote a book in the 60s called Who Rules America? And the idea behind uh, this book was basically seeing if he could identify a cohesive class of Americans that wielded inordinate power and influence over policy in the United States. Uh, and of course he did, I mean, of course. Uh, <laughs> so it was actually a very, you know, I encourage if you're interested in American power structure stuff, it's a very interesting read. Um, and it's very methodologically rigorous. He actually went through the rosters of social clubs and, and uh, mapped the connections between corporate boards and found all these layers of of connections that suggested that there was actually a very tightly networked and small group of people uh, in the United States with this inordinate power that tended to be very closely associated with uh, corporate capital, but was also part of a sort of social upper class and a part of a policy planning network. Um, and you know, that, those are sort of uh, old ideas or, or that field of, of that particular discipline within sociology didn't really after the 70s, it sort of died off, but we're seeing a resurgence in the academy of studying these things in the United States. Um, so this is a quote from a recent study uh, from a Princeton professor and a Northwestern professor that identified, um, basically looked at economic elites in the United States and what kind of influence they had, and found that economic elites and their organized groups um, representing business interests have substantial ind independent influence over US policy and uh, average citizens and, and interest groups, mass-based interest groups, have relatively little influence. This is a study that was just is just actually going to be published in September, uh, and a lot of journalists ran with this and said that the U.S. is actually an oligarchy. So what do you do if you have, well, before I get to that next one, um, this is a very, uh, you know, my eyes glaze over when I look at wealth inequality gra graphs sometimes, and I just kind of picked one and threw it up there. Um, but if you're wondering about the question of who is winning in our society, it's pretty clear that a tiny sliver of the population uh, closely associated with this power elite in the US, but also globally, is controlling massive amounts of wealth compared to the, the rest of us. And that's something that we need to, to do something about. And um, so what do, we, what do we come up with given, you know, given these surveillance techniques, given this power structure? Uh, my co-founder and I, a few years ago, came up with the idea for littlesis.org, which is like the opposite of Big Brother, watching up. We sometimes describe it as an involuntary Facebook of powerful people. So instead of profiling your friends, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, instead of building your own profile and adding your friendships to other people and giving Facebook all that lovely data to play with, Little Sis is about mapping the relationships of the power elite uh, and mapping uh, what, whether they be um, CEOs, politicians, or anyone else with a lot of influence over society. This is the front page. 
it's littlesys.org if you want to check it out. Um, so it's a free open database of information on powerful people. We have profiles of over 140,000 different people and organizations ranging from, uh, like I said, politicians and corporate executives and investors and lobbyists to uh, banks, their, their various businesses, their, the, the government institutions with which they're associated, the NGOs, whether they be foundations, think tanks, uh, policy organizations. Little Sis, uh, much like Total Information Awareness, is very focused on relationships and networks because that data is really key to understanding power. Um, and the types of relationships we're tracking are everything from employment to familial ties to social ties to contracts, donations, uh, ownership relationships. Um, and it's all assembled in this large graph through uh, two basic systems of data acquisition, one through a system of bots and scrapers, the other through a community of editors that is constantly working to improve the data, uh, improve the data in this involuntary, involuntary Facebook. Uh, so I, I want to point out a few key differences here before I you know, draw the comparison too closely. On the one hand, we have Big Brother. On the other, Little Sis, Big Brother. Total, as symbolized, uh, total information awareness, I feel like, is a good proxy for Big Brother. Um, we've got surveillance on the one hand, transparency on the other. Uh, muckraking, by the way, maybe I shouldn't have included that in the title of my talk, but it's sort of like uh, investigative journalism targeting powerful people and organizations uh, and kind of airing their dirty laundry. So it's kind of what we're working on at Little Sis. Um, on the one hand, Big Brother Total Information Awareness has this gigantic haystack of billions of people in which they're trying to find these, these little needles of potential terrorists, um, whereas Little Sis has a really relatively small haystack, uh, only thousands of people that we've identified so far that have this uh, wealth and influence in our society. That's a huge advantage for us. Um, on the one hand, the target for Big Brother is terrorism, or maybe terrorism, maybe it's about repressing dissent. On the other hand, uh, we're mapping this power to try to understand it in our society, understand the role the power structure plays, but also to identify the corruption that is driving uh, an agenda where policies continually re reward the 1%, the wealthy, at the expense of the many. Um, one obtains data through private, uh, invasive means, illegally obtained data in many cases. Um, little sis, we're mapping data that is already all uh, public record. We're collecting it and we're using it to analyze exactly you know what's happening. But central to both is this idea that we're organizing data on people, organizations, relationships, and the networks that, that those are the building blocks of. This is a sample profile page. I'm not going to do a full demo of the site, but um, this is one of my favorite power brokers in, in the US. Favorites, I don't mean that really. It's not like my favorite, but he's like uh, really powerful, and uh, his protégés tend to wield a lot of influence over economic policy in the US. Uh, he's a former Treasury Secretary. This is what a profile page looks like. Um, it's only showing government positions and some business positions uh, in this screenshot, but there's a lot more there on his professional colleagues, on who he gives money to. Um, and it's on the right, we have the source links pointing back to the prov provenance of all that data. So this is a basic starting point for an investigation of a Robert Rubin and his network. Um, one thing when you start putting all this data together on powerful people and their organizations, you can identify interesting patterns in the data. Uh, one tool that we have on Little Sys allows you to see interlocks between different people uh, or organizations. So we've got Robert Rubin on the left, who's the former Treasury Secretary and wields a lot of influence over economic policy. And then uh, Larry Summers on the right. Larry Summers is a former economic advisor to President Obama. And you can see that they have all these common connections through not only the Department of the Treasury, uh, also the White House, but then businesses like Citigroup, um, uh, think tanks like the Partnership for Public Service and um, the Hamilton Project uh, is another one. 
this is one way of sort of visualizing the data in little sys. It's a tool that we built called the Oligrapher, which is like oligarchy and graphing. So oligarchy, lots of powerful people controlling everything, graphing things, and you can basically build all kinds of fun maps like this, and I'll show you a few more examples as we go. Um, it's inspired partly, I don't know how well you can see that, but it's inspired, our, our graphing techniques are inspired partly by an artist named Mark Lombardi, uh, who developed these really intricate graphs of power structures, uh, issues of corruption related to everything from, uh, well, just a, a whole range of different scandals in sort of American politics at the very upper reaches of society. Um, a site called theyrule.net. Has anyone seen that before? So theyrule.net uh, was a site that actually launched maybe 10, almost 15 years ago now. Um, it was put together by an artist collective. It's basically a site that lets you explore the connections between corporate boards. Um, and the idea be being that these people who sit on the boards of major corporations in the U United States actually play a huge role in, in ruling us. Who rules America? They rule America. So um, right now, theyrule.net actually draws uh, data from the little sys API um, rather than maintain that data themselves. A um, few other just sample maps. This is the CIA InQtel investment web, which we're slowly sort of building out. Uh, it's a map of, of those investments and some of the uh, networks involved there. This is a map of uh, the FCC is a regulator of uh, communications sector in the US. Uh, it's a government regulator. Um, this shows uh, on the left we have the government regulator. In the middle we have all the various staff people in the office of the chairman of the FCC. And then on the right we see all the companies that they used to work for very recently before joining the government regulator. And so when you map these kinds of questions it raises obvious, I mean, these, this kinds of data raises obvious questions about who these people are really representing and what interests they're serving in their role as public officials. So what's the point of all this? I mean, we kind of learn something about the power structure as we go. We kind of learn how policy is being, you know, is being shaped, but, but where does it really get us? And I'm gonna share a few stories, of sort of issues of corruption that we've highlighted in our work at Little Sis and the Public Accountability Initiative that kind of illustrate what you can do with this data when you pinpoint that needle in this much smaller haystack. Um, so this story I like to call, uh, fitting with the theme of the presentation, the senator's little brother. Um, and it all has to, it all starts, the story starts with the announcement of a major merger of two telecommunications companies, two cable companies, internet providers in the US, uh, Time Warner Cable and Comcast. Uh, the merger was announced earlier this year is widely criticized by uh, public interest groups like Free Press, said it would be a disaster. Uh, another senator, Al Franken, formerly of Saturday Night Live in the US, uh, uh, said it would be bad for consumers. So there was a lot of, there was a large public outcry about this. Um, my senator, Senator Schumer, who represents me in Washington, uh, said that he was very pleased with the news. And then he said, he said it seems like the Time Warner Cable acquisition will be a good deal for New York. Um, which, you know, I thought that was interesting. He said that like two days after they announced the merger, like very quickly, he was like, I think it's a good thing. This is great. So, you know, when you look at Senator Schumer, I'm gonna use some graphs to sort of illustrate where I'm going here. Uh, when you look at Senator Schumer, you know, the way he'd often be described in the media is as a senator from New York. He sits on the antitrust subcommittee of the US Senate, so he has oversight over mergers such as this one. He advises the Department of Justice on whether they should investigate or block these kinds of mergers. So he has a special public responsibility to represent me and represent um, the rest of his state in this matter. And uh, so, you know, this is the kind of this is the portion of the graph that you'd see in the media when you see Senator Schumer describe. What you wouldn't know, uh, just from reading the news reports about this, is that Senator Schumer's brother actually played a huge role in this merger. Uh, his name is Robert Schumer. He's the little brother of the senator. 
and he was the lawyer for Time Warner Cable that put the whole deal together. Um, I put up, I'm going to put up some numbers once in a while. This number represents Robert Schumer's salary as a lawyer for the firm that put the, the well, essentially as a lawyer for Time Warner Cable. Um, Four million dollars a year is a pretty, pretty healthy salary. Um, so by exploring Senator Schumer's social web, we've identified a financial stake that his family actually has in this, and something that raises questions about the potential for corruption. Uh, it's a clear conflict of interest. There's a financial stake. There's the public interest on the one hand, but then there's the private interest, uh, the interest that's making a lot of money on this deal on the other. So we ran a story on our blog. I actually, uh, sometimes I'm kind of pessimistic about things actually happening when, when we do things like this. So I kind of just stuck it up on the blog and I actually had the day off and I, I, I went off into, I went, I, I was, wasn't in the office this day, but by the time I came back, there we go. Schumer had actually recused himself from oversight of the deal. Uh, he was questioned about this by the media, uh, said that his, his staff said that indeed it was a conflict of interest and that he would no longer play a role in overseeing the merger. He would no longer release these statements applauding it. Um, he had basically removed himself and his defense was kind of ridiculous. He claimed that he didn't know uh, that his brother had worked on this deal. His brother had been a lawyer for Time Warner Cable since 1989. Uh, but these are the lies that the power elite in, in the US, which sometimes just looks remarkably insane and arrogant to me, uh, what, they, what they think they can get away with, um, those are the kinds of lies that you read sometimes in the media. So, so you know, Senator Schumer uh, had no idea that, this, that his brother was involved in this deal. And, and we basically have to accept accept that. Um, so that's one story. I think just a couple of key points about it. It's all about mapping relationships. Um, the data that we used to pull that story together uh, was certainly looking at things that don't always get talked about in the media, like familial relationships. But it was actually out there. It was easily, you know, relatively easy to find once we knew what we were looking for. Um, it also um, I mean, it was so ridiculous that Robert Schumer was named a lawyer of the week uh, the week before we broke this story, and no one had said, oh, well, that's the senator's brother that had played a huge role in this deal. So, um, so there's a lot to be gained by conducting this kind of, of surveillance. Let me just check how I'm doing on time. Another story that I'll try to go through a bit more quickly, but this is the military industrial pundit. Uh, we all know about the military industrial complex and the role that plays in the US and globally where you know, we have corporations joining hands with the military um, and making a lot of money in that whole process. Uh, and then we have a lot of pundits, a lot of talking heads in the media that have a profound effect on how policy gets shaped in the US. Um, so this kind of brings those two, this story brings those two things together. Um, uh, Stephen Hadley, the gentleman on the, on the right here, uh, publish, publishes a lot of op-eds and goes on TV a lot, um, publishes things like this, Americans can be proud of what we achieved in Iraq. Um, so basically, yeah, you get a sense of what his policy stances tend to be, uh, kind of like bombs away, kill everyone, war, 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 that sort of thing. Um, so often when he goes on the media, uh, when he publishes op-eds, he's described as a former Bush advisor, uh, former White House official, uh, and then, you know, I don't know if, how well you can read them, but these blue dots to the right just represent the fact that he publishes op-eds in the Washington Post, that he comments on these various uh, issues in foreign policy. What never gets disclosed in the media when he calls for airstrikes or when he calls for military supplies for particular countries or what have you, is that he's also on the board of a major weapons maker, uh, Raytheon. If you expand the social graph for Stephen Hadley uh, and look at things that aren't being reported in the media, it turns out that he's actually a board member of Raytheon. Um, you can see that you know on the, the talk of war, 
Raytheon uh, shares hit record highs in, on the on the on Syria war talk. These are just headlines I pulled from the Wall Street Journal and other places. Uh, another headline: Raytheon executive sees Ukraine threat boosting de defense budgets. It talks about how their profits surge on merely the talk of of war in countries abroad that the U.S. involved in. U.S. is involved in. Um, actually, Raytheon makes the Tomahawk missiles that would have been used in the Syria airstrikes. Um, and just to go to some more numbers, uh, you know, a board position, what does that really mean? Does a board position mean you just volunteer a bunch of time? No, it actually means he makes $128,000 in cash every year, just pure cash compensation, and he has a million dollars in stock. Um, so again, we've got a pretty clear financial conflict of interest. And so we published a report um, on conflicts of interest, this was back during the Syria debate, conflict of, conflicts of interest uh, on the part of talking heads like Stephen Hadley uh, and the Washington Post ran an article on it. So this got a little bit more sunlight, but you don't always have impact. Uh, he didn't, you don't have impact in a really measurable sense. Uh, so Stephen Hadley actually recently became chair of the US Institute of Peace. Um, so his reputation hasn't been so far damaged that he can't, you know, hold on to positions like that uh, with a, you know, you know, people kind of still look at him with a straight face. He's still out in the media, um, and these ties still aren't being disclosed. Just to point out, the U.S. Institute of Peace was founded in, uh, guess what year it was founded in? Can you read that? Anyone have a guess? It's the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, it's chaired by a guy who really loves war. War, peace. Uh, 1984, sorry. It's 1984 that it was founded. Uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace was founded in 1984. Uh, interesting patterns we're finding here. So um, anyway, yeah, he's still not disclosing his Raytheon ties. Um, but actually, the host of this program did apologize after Stephen Hadley's appearance, uh, calling for probably war and more bombing of Gaza or something. Um, did apologize for it and. Uh, said that he would no longer uh, fail to identify the, these defense industry ties. Finally, who's heard about fracking? I think we heard a little bit about it in the last one of the last talks. Um, this is the story of Dr. Frankenstein. Just to close it out, um, Dr. Frankenstein, uh, fracking is a is a process of natural gas drilling uh, that's relatively new and very controversial. It has a lot of public health and environmental effects and consequences for the communities where it happens. It also has uh, climate effects. And Dr. Frankenstein was involved in a study that the University of Texas put out uh, finding that fracking does not pollute groundwater uh, back in 2012. And so this was interesting because, again, it sort of make, makes you rise, raise your eyebrows. I mean, a lot of, at the very least, this question is sort of unsettled. Uh, to see a university put out a report that says actually fracking does not pollute groundwater was kind of an extreme thing. Um, and it made all these headlines of reporters ran with this. Wow, this study found that fracking doesn't actually pollute groundwater, even though all these people in Texas and Pennsylvania say that it's making them sick. Um, and this gentleman, Professor Grote, uh, Charles Grote at the University of Texas was the author of the report. Uh, so we started looking into exactly where this report was coming from, given the media impact it was having, given that the public debate around fracking is so heated, and that mostly these questions are really unsettled. Um, and we found that, guess what? He was on the board of a gas company and didn't disclose it. So he had authored this report claiming that fracking did not contaminate groundwater. If you expand his social graph, you find that he's on the board of a gas driller. Uh, the, mil the numbers there. Uh, 1.6 million in stock, $400,000 a year in compensation for a part-time position. Um, and this, we released a report on this, um, and the end result was actually quite positive. They retracted the report. They found a lot of problems with the report. Uh, Charles Grote, the professor who was supposedly the lead author of the report, claimed that he hadn't read the report, even though he was kind of characterizing it to the media. Um, kind of extraordinary. He actually resigned from the University of Texas, uh, and they fired the director of the Energy Institute that put it out. 
this is a cartoon that kind of draw, drew on some of our work around uh, fracking and, and academic studies of fracking. You know, earlier Yetta was talking about the role that an academic from the University of California at Berkeley played in the debate around the coal plant here. And academics can often play uh, the opposite role in sort of smoothing the way for a power structure that really wants to make money and get away with things. And um, that was the role that Grote was playing here. So um, some takeaways from these stories. Uh, relationships and networks are key. Uh, power elite networks are tend to be very dense. There's a huge potential for conflicts of interest and corruption in those networks. That's really how they function. They, they need that. Um, it's often not as simple. Corruption uh, that we look at is not as simple as an elite finding an illegal bribe. That would always be great, but sometimes it's a lot uh, harder than that. Um, and these things aren't always necessarily illegal. Um, the data is often out there, but no one's looking at it, no one's collecting it, organizing it, and analyzing it. Um, and then exposing these stories can, but not always, have significant effect. Um, let me just see how much time. I'm Got about five minutes, so um, these same techniques that I described, these same research methods and data collection can be applied to all kinds of different contexts at every level of geography. Um, who, who rules Chicago? Who rules Kosovo? It is um, something that that you know these these methods can be applied in lots of different domains, and I think it's really important that we do. Um, start to develop a better understanding of this power structure, uh, not just in the U.S., but in different regions within the U.S. and, and abroad as well. And, and there are actually efforts to do that uh, elsewhere. This is just a research group on Little Sis that's looking at power at the regional level in Chicago and putting together data on the power structure there, uh, and putting together maps like this, for instance, of the Chicago Board of Education. Um, the uh, Software behind Little Sis is actually up on GitHub. It's not necessarily in the most stable release right now, but there are other efforts as well to look at um, building tools that facilitate this kind of network analysis and that can be applied in different regions and countries. Another one is Praderapedia. Uh, they're focused on Chile and other countries in Latin America. Uh, we've got Grano, which is a project out of Germany to facilitate power mapping. Uh, in mostly newsroom contexts, um, but it's in its early stages and it could actually be something that can be used in lots of different contexts. Uh, and I, I find it really promising. So that's also on, on GitHub. Um, challenges are always data availability, um, legal barriers like libel law. Uh, obviously the power structure can vary and patterns of corruption can vary widely as well. Um, Data silos are bad because oftentimes these power structures uh, connect to one another. Uh, looking at the power structure here, you have to account for the power structure in the US as well. So uh, putting that data in two different silos wouldn't necessarily work. You want to be able to connect them, and that's kind of a key challenge going forward. Um, I'm not going to go through all that. There's a bunch of, you know, I think there's a lot of hope for the future. One of the key things I want to highlight is that there's actually a global power network mapping, uh, global power mapping network forming, maybe needs a better name, um, that connects groups in different countries that are doing this kind of work. Um, and finally, just to close it off, I want to say something about who exactly Big Brother is. We've heard a little bit about this so far, but if you just take some of the, the techniques of power structure research and power structure analysis and apply them to the question of who Big Brother is, uh, you can get, or who is really behind Big Brother, you can get to some interesting answers. So, you know, when Edward Snowden released his, um, you know, when the Snowden data came out, um, polls varied a bit, but they actually found that most Americans approved of what he did in releasing that data. Um, some other polls showed you know, him with maybe 31% uh, support and 33% against. Um, this poll found 50% in support 
But there was at least, at the very least, there was a divide in American society over whether Snowden had done the right thing. And so when Snowden bumps up, the best way to find out where the power structure is is to sort of bump up against it, and then you can kind of identify what it is, and you kind of touch it, it's, it's hot, it bites back. And, and so the power structure bit back at Edward Snowden. Um, and that power structure wasn't just a big brother confined to government. Um, it's really important to understand that the surveillance apparatus isn't just about some dark force within government. It's about a power elite that really crosses these kinds of boundaries. So between government and business or NGOs, this is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, a very influential think tank, uh, saying, why is the media using the term whistleblower to describe Edward Snowden? It's too sympathetic. This is a, a venture capitalist who's probably a billionaire, calls him a traitor, says that if you look up in the encyclopedia, uh, there's a picture of Edward Snowden. If you know, if you watched uh, the show Meet the Press, which I don't, but some a lot of people do apparently, um, Glenn Greenwald went on uh, that show and was questioned about why he, uh, by this major media figure, David Gregory, why he shouldn't be charged as a criminal, given his work abetting Edward Snowden. So there's an obvious conclusion here, which is the one percent really hearts big brother and, and likes what it's doing and identifies with this mission um, that it's dedicated itself to. Um, and that, and just to, to, to build on that a little bit more, this power structure isn't just defending big brother, it's making a lot of money on it. The lines between government and business blur. This isn't just a dark force within government. This is Keith Alexander, the ex-NSA chief who can walk out the door of the NSA and now claims he can make a million dollars a month uh, selling technology that he somehow came up with in his private time at, at the NSA to major banks and other corporations to help them with their surveillance, which again highlights that surveillance isn't about just about the state, but about something a little bit different than that. Uh, Edward Snowden, of course, worked at Booz Allen Hamilton, Booz Allen Hamilton being very well connected to lots of uh, government institutions and drawing 99% of its revenue from the government. So this question of Big Brother isn't just about, like I said, just to highlight that again, uh, this dark force within within government, um, but something much bigger, uh, something that really points to this uh, question of who rules America, but who rules anywhere. It's about the power structure, and if we're going to get serious about challenging that power structure, we have to get serious about documenting it exposing it, and, um, and I, I see that as an important way forward. So I want to thank you so much for your attention, uh, and it's been a real honor to be here, and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. So thank you. And if you have any questions, I don't know, are we done with questions? Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Do we have any questions before I ask a question, maybe? Teresa? <laughs> Hi. Yeah, Arenit has a question there, over there. Yeah, two questions, actually. Um, how do you deal with um, libel? And uh, how do you deal with, uh, how would you deal with something like this in a country like Kosovo, where uh, family connections are all around, and they can say, well, what can I do there? I, my family member has a right to be in that position, and uh, I cannot control that. Um, so the first question uh, is libel, and, and the answer is that, that the US is actually a relatively, I don't have a great understanding of, of libel law internationally. The US is actually a relatively, When it comes to public figures, people with some kind of public status, an argument can be made here um, that everyone in the database has that. Um, the libel laws is, is relatively weak. And also, um, all of the data in the database is very well sourced. Um, you can't add any, any information to the database without providing some kind of source. All modifications are transparent. We're co constantly checking them. Um, all of these relationships uh, really have to exist or be documented elsewhere on the web. 
for them to go into Little Sis. It isn't really a whistleblower site or a site where I can go on and say, oh, actually, I personally know that this person is connected to this person. Um, we kind of need other evidence of that. And that helps, I think, guard against the potential for libelous data and false data being, being added. Um, the second question, uh, I, I don't, I think you lost the microphone, but I didn't quite understand. So the question is um, whether, I mean, part, part, I think part of it goes to whether familial ties, whether family ties make you or anyone guilty of anything. And I think that's not the point. Do I understand it properly? Yeah. I, that's really not the point of, of the database. It isn't about taking, building profiles of people and saying this person profiled here is guilty of something. It's merely saying this person profiled here is part of a larger power structure um, that they're well connected to in, in these various ways. And so when it gets down to the question of whether some family member with, you know, who doesn't have any position of, of influence is going to be mapped there. No, these, these are family members with positions of influence in Kosovo. That's, that's okay. the case because we are such a small society. So eventually you end up being a cousin with somebody else uh, in power. So uh, that's the situation here. I mean, maybe, maybe giving more people access to that data would, you know, maybe I know how to make things happen if I know you, you know? Yeah. Any more questions? Kevin, I have one question. I have one question. How do you prioritize in terms of whom do you choose to, re regarding to the, late, like, let's say, we didn't have NSA before, and we just suddenly, it's the topic of the day of the, of the week. And how long does it take for you to map it up, and how do you prioritize? That's a good question. I, I it actually, I mean, the, this, when we first started, we thought, oh, it, you know, this is a relatively small group of people. It won't be that hard to put all this data together. It's actually much harder than we thought. Uh, in that way, we're sort of like total information awareness and in that we're, way, we're in way over our heads. Uh, but so when something comes along like the NSA, um, or InQtel is a good example of, of uh, there was a story recently involving InQtel, which is the CIA's investment arm. And so we can put together very basic data on it very quickly, um, but to really dig into the networks and identify conflicts of interest and that sort of thing, it takes uh, kind of a long, you know, it can be a, a long time. And then sometimes you find stuff right away, and then other times it, it's, a, it's a more arduous process. And then in terms of like how we choose what we look at, it's partly about just identifying big issues in American public policy debates. Uh, something comes along in the news cycle, uh, an issue like fracking has been in the media for a long time. There's a lot of money moving towards it. There's a phrase in investigative journalism that you follow the money. Um, we're about following the money in the economy, following the big money in the economy. And the big money in the economy is going towards things like fracking right now. Uh, it's involved in war, obviously, and, and it's, in, it's implicated in these large mer mergers that are ultimately accruing benefits to uh, the one percent and and Wall Street and these companies. So, does that answer? Yeah.